list. <coughs> Um, or an OT, if you like, and uh, an occupational therapist is someone who helps uh, people, both adults and children, when they're having trouble doing the things that occupy their time, hence the term occupational. Um, sometimes it is having to do with their jobs, but when it's working with children, as I do, I work with children with learning disabilities, uh, it's more about having them do the jobs of learning in school, interacting with their friends, playing, and being part of their family. Traditionally, we're taught that there are three different types of learners in school, and your teacher might ask you, uh, how do you think you learn best? Are you a visual learner who learns best when information is presented that you can see? Are you an auditory learner who understands and remembers information best when it's something you've heard? Or are you a kinesthetic or tactile learner, which is fancy terms for you need to move or you need to touch something in order to recall information best. What I've learned about how children learn is that these three ways of taking inform in information don't work as well unless this thing is calibrated and working efficiently. It has to take in information and process it effectively. So what is this thing? This is your vestibular cochlear complex. And it's a really uninviting term for a part of your body that is so essential and so important and so sensitive. To keep me from tripping over the term vestibular cochlear, I'm just going to call it the VC complex. And there's some things that I want you to know about the VC complex. First of all, we have two one on either side of our head, deeply embedded in your skull in the hardest bone in your body. So that tells me, biologically, that it must be a very important structure that you have two of them in case something goes wrong, and they're very deep and very well protected. Second, the VC complex is fully developed and fully myelinated in utero. This means it's the only sensory system that we have that comes out from birth ready to go, ready to interact with the world. And finally, it's incredibly sensitive. It takes little fine compressions in airwaves that we can't see and we can't feel in our skin, but turns it into sound that you can hear. It senses the position of your head independent of any other information, like a super accurate Wii game controller. So what is it and what is it doing? Well, this part that looks like a snail is your cochlea. And this is the part that hears sound. It takes those compressions in the airwaves and turns it into neural impulses that reach the brain as what you hear. These little loopy tubes here, that's your vestibule. And that part of the organ senses your position in space in regards to your head. Is your head moving up and down? Is it turning around an axis? Um, are you standing still or are you on the move? And the vestibular part of this system takes that information and combines it with information from your body, your joints, and your muscles, so that you know you're keeping your head in upright using your muscles when you lean forward. Or that you know that you're tracking something with your eyes by moving your head, or you're holding your head still and tracking something just by moving your eyes. Your VC system is always on. It's always giving you information. And that makes it unique because you can close your eyes to stop seeing an image you don't want to see. And you can pull your hand back to stop touching something you don't want to feel. But your VC system is always giving you information even when you're asleep. If I had to give you one sentence that sums up what this system does for us, it's this. The vestibule, your vestibular system, gives you your position in space your gravitational center. Your auditory system, the cochlea, gives you the sense of the space that you're in. So as you develop from birth, this system comes out and is fully ready to go, so it becomes kind of a ground zero, a platform, on which all the other learning that takes place as you grow happens. All the information you're taking in as a, as a newborn is sensed through the VC complex. And as your eye muscles, your neck muscles, and your core muscles develop, it combines with the VC complex to become a very neurologically intricate triangle that controls your attention and where it goes. And it looks something like this. So that when you sense something novel in your environment, typically through sound, your neck and core muscles and your body muscles coordinate to turn towards that sound, and then your visual motor muscles 
are very finely tuned to isolate exactly what you're supposed to be focusing on visually, and that is how you can attend to something and learn it. So once you've gotten that point in space you're supposed to be attending to and you get a bit of information from that interaction, your brain then takes that bit of information and files it away in the proper file in your information database in your brain. So that the next time you encounter that stimulus, you'll recognize it. You'll say, aha, I know that. Well, the trick is, when you encounter one stimulus, that's great, you file it away. The next time you encounter that same stimulus, that same feeling, that same sound, that same motion has to be the exact same for it to go to the right file in your filing cabinet. If it's even just a little bit different, it'll get filed under new information instead of old information. Remember how sensitive I said the vestibular complex was? Well, if a baby who's learning has an ear infection or chronic allergies or autism or any one of a number of things, then that information gets misfiled quite often. And so for those kids who aren't getting reliable information from their VC complex, they're constantly having to file and refile information, and they have to be exposed to the same information multiple times for it to go into the right place. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say a baby is learning the sound, ah. Well, they have to be able to hear the sound, ah, look at mom's mouth and see the ah shape, and then give it a go. But if they hear the sound, ah, and the second time mom says, ah, they actually hear, uh, because maybe there's excessive background noise or they have that ear infection, then it's going to go to the wrong filing cabinet. And then as soon as they finally say, ah, ah, okay, enough times that I understand the ah sound, then they've got it. Well, that doesn't seem like such a big deal, but babies and children have these types of interactions hundreds of times a day. So if every moment that that child is feeling is a little bit harder than it should be, that child's just not going to learn very efficiently. So when they get reliable information from their VC complex, the information can go to the correct file cabinet and learning becomes more efficient. The other side of this coin, when a baby or a child isn't filing information to the right file cabinet, is when old information is constantly getting filed as new information, and then they can't direct their attention to where they want it to go. So if baby brother's over here playing with a toy, and it's making noise, instead of the child saying, okay, I recognize that noise, that's fine, I want to concentrate on this, that child is constantly having the circuits in their brain for new information tripped and coming back over here to this instead of devoting their full attention to what they want to be learning. So there was a time not long ago when all babies were thought to be blank slates, and we as adults taught them everything that they need to know. Um, since then, in the last few decades, there's been a lot of research into how babies' brains develop. And luckily, we've come to learn that they do a lot of things on their own. And they learn through experiential learning just by being part of the world. In their book, The Scientist in the Crib, Alison Gopnik, Andrew Mautzlov, and Patricia Kuhl propose the idea that all babies are scientists. They take in information, data, from the world around them, and they run mini experiments, categorizing the information that they take in to help make sense of the world. They're working on their database when they throw a toy from the tray of their high chair. It starts off as a physics experiment. How much force is required to eject this toy over the edge of my tray? And then it turns into a human subjects research when dad picks it up and puts it back on the tray. And then it becomes a psychology experiment the tenth time when dad goes, toy, sub it. <laughs> so all that information gets filed and that becomes part of their integration into learning about how the world works. So Gopnik and her colleagues took these little mini experiments and said, how do babies use these to solve three big problems about how life operates on Earth? Those three big problems that babies have to figure out are, one, the other minds problem. I'm one person, and all of these moving sacks of skin around me are also people with different ideas and different thoughts. How do I come to understand that? The external world problem. How come these objects in my visual field keep changing shape? A table is still a table whether you view it from the side or you view it from above. 
But you can't come to understand what a table is for until you understand that a table is always a table, no matter how you're viewing it. And finally, there's the language problem. Oops, didn't mean to hit that yet. There's the language problem. I mean, how do people use these funny sounds and gestures to communicate entire thoughts and ideas? So let's take a look at how the VC complex helps us figure out these three big problems. First of all, for the other minds problem, we need a few things that the VC complex gives us. First of all, we need to know our center. The vestibular system tells us exactly where our gravitational center is, and we know whether it's still or on the move, so that we know we don't take up the same space as other people, and they might be moving while we're still, or we might be on the move while they are still. We need to be able to localize sound, to sense where sound is coming from in our environment so that we can track other people doing different things than what we're doing. Our first experience with this is hearing mom, seeing mom, but then continuing to hear mom even after we can't see her. She's left our field of vision. She might have left the room, but she still exists even though we can't see her. And finally, in order to solve the, uh, the other minds problem, we need to understand basic time. We need to understand before and after and cause and effect. So that we understand when we cry, it creates a reaction in mom. If we didn't see the connection in time between our cry and mom's response, we might give up crying altogether because we don't understand that our action creates the response that we want. Our earliest interaction with time and sequencing is through sound. Sound is the only thing that we take in through our senses that requires time. You can see a picture instantly. You can feel a sensation instantaneously, but to hear a word, you require the entire time that it takes to say that word. To hear a symphony, you require the entire time it takes to hear that sound. So individual sounds mean nothing until they've been combined across time. To solve the external world problem, you need a lot of the same skills and a few others. You need your center, your vestibular center, so that you know how the visual shape of objects is going to change as you can sense your center moving around them. It's a little less obvious that you need to be able to hear objects in your visual field. We use how sound bounces off of things as a reference to know how deep to focus our eyes, our depth perception. How this develops is that, sorry, when we're infants and we're placed on the floor, we babble, ba ba ba, and sound bounces off the floor back to our ears, and subconsciously we kind of time that. We can, our ears are so sensitive in, in parsing time that we can tell in those milliseconds how long it takes for the sound to bounce back to us. And we can see where that distance is with our hands, so we subconsciously learn when to focus our eyes or where to focus our eyes based on where the sound is coming from. Like bats and dolphins and elephants, we use echolocation, how sound bounces off of objects in our environment to get a mental map of the space that we're in. And we continue to do this throughout life. If I were to blindfold you and bring you into this room with no other people in it, at the door, or maybe slightly inside the door, you'd be able to tell me the room is fairly large. You'd be able to guess that there's furniture in it. And you might even know that there's carpet on the floor, just by using your sense of sound. Now, finally, there's the language problem. Based on what I've told you about how the VC complex helps us solve the other minds problem and the external world problem, the link between the VC complex and the language problem should be kind of obvious. We need to be able to find someone's <coughs> voice, sound localization. We need to know how to control our muscles to focus on their mouths and their faces, our gravitational center. We need to understand that time is going by so that they can communicate the entire word or the entire idea to us and we don't turn around and ignore them halfway through what they're going to say and only walk away with half of the information. So the question becomes, how do we learn to do that? You know, how does that develop? How do we learn to pick up their voice from all of the background sounds or understand the patterns of speech to know when they're done talking and it's okay to respond or they're done and we've gotten all the information? So what's, when we pick out the sounds that we want to hear from the environment, that's called auditory figure ground. But before I tell you how auditory figure ground develops, I want to tell you a little bit about the chicken in the egg. 
Not the chicken or the egg, because I don't know the answer to that one. This is about how chickens learn something that they need to know from the moment they come into the world. Because I think there's a nice corollary between how chickens learn this skill and how we learn to know things that we think are just instinct, things that we kind of need to know from the moment we're born. Chickens begin to peck the ground for food right after they hatch. And everybody always thought, well, this is just something that's given to them by God. They know how to do this. It's instinct. Well, in the 1920s, Chinese researcher Kuo Jin Yang discovered that if you coat a chicken egg with uh, petroleum jelly, it becomes translucent, and you can hold it up to the light, and you can observe a baby chick in the egg without disturbing it. And what he noted, in the last week in the egg, a chick runs out of space. So they're curled up inside that egg, and their heart is beating. And as their heart beats, it moves their head, which is resting on their chest, up and down, in a pecking motion. So for the last week of life, the chick is practicing pecking the ground. And it's instinct when they're born. This is how it is with figure ground, auditory figure ground. When we're in mom's belly, around six months of gestation, our auditory nerves are fully myelinated, meaning that we can hear almost as well as we hear once we're born. <coughs> but it's really loud in there. If you plug your ears, you can hear how loud it is in the human body. And that's all deep, low-frequency noise. So it's just kind of a, a loud, cacophonous environment. We can hear outside noises too, not just the noises inside mom's body. We can hear dad's voice and we can hear mom's voice, but it's coming through the liquid that's in there, the amniotic fluid. So it's kind of like when you listen underwater when you're going swimming. You just can't hear that well. Sometime around this time, we also run out of room in the womb, and our head starts to make contact with mom's spine or pelvis or rib cage, depending on how we're oriented. And then all of a sudden, we hear her voice through bon bone-conducted sound. It's as if you plug your ears and start talking, that's bone-conducted sound. Sound travels better through bone, better and faster than it does through the air or than it does through water. So it's all of a sudden like you're listening to mom on an amplifier. And her voice is higher pitched than all of those body sounds like blood rushing and food digesting. So you get to practice for the last two months that you're in the womb hearing that sound that you want to hear over all of those background noises. You get to practice auditory figure ground, just like the chicken gets to practice pecking the ground before he's hatched. That way, when you're born, you're all ready to go to focus on the original speech teacher, your mom. You're already tuned for her voice, which I think is pretty cool. For the teachers in the room that are interested in how auditory uh, learning happens and how sound affects our learning. I want to point you toward Julian Treasure's TED Talk on how architects need to use their ears more. I don't know if it's kosher to reference somebody else's TED Talk while you're giving a TED Talk. I don't really care. You really need to hear that TED Talk. So, in order to solve the three big problems, the other minds problem, the external world problem, and the language problem, we begin by scaffolding our experiences in the world on top of the only interface that we have that's ready to go from the minute we're born. It's as if we're turned on like a computer at birth and we start taking in and processing information and the vestibular auditory system is the operating system that we're given at the factory. We add the peripherals of vision, we add the peripherals of touch and motion on top of this operating system that's already established, the vestibular cochlear system. And that's how we make sense of the world. Thank you.